Hey guys, it's Mr. Post, and on today's video, we're going to be looking at closing the door to what we've been working on recently on Ionic Bonds. We're going to be looking at transferring now and going into covalent bonds, and this video is really going to be the leaving of Ionic Bonds and introducing covalent bonds. And in order to do so, we're going to be highlighting some things such as the differences between ionic and covalent bonds. In the next video, we'll get to the next objective, which is drawing Lewis dot structures that show and demonstrate covalent bonding. For right now, though, we're focusing on the first three bolts. Okay, so here we go. Ionic bonding is, and as we saw before, the attraction. That was the key word that I wanted to, everyone to get in ionic bonds, the attraction of a cation for an anion. Let's just pause right there. It was the attraction between ions. We had an ion such as Na+, plus and also Cl minus, forgive me for that, and it was the attraction between the plus and the minus. All right, so we're talking cations were positive and anions were negative. And because one was positive, one was negative, I had an attraction. And that is what my ionic bond was. It was literally the attractive forces between positive and negative anions. That resulted from the transfer of electrons. So once again, ionic bonds with attraction, of a cation for an anion resulting from the transfer of electrons. I do want to key on this. This is what we got out of that. The bond was the plus minus attraction. Now, as we go over to covalent bonds, we're not going to see the word attraction there anymore. We're simply going to see the bond is nothing more than shared electrons. Now, on ionic bonds, the electrons, I had really kind of keyed on this, the electrons caused the bond to happen, but they were not the bond. In covalent bonds, the shared electrons are the covalent bond. And as we look at our periodic table here, guys, we're going to notice some familiar things. Uh, this side of the periodic table, where are the metals? So anything in this case green with the metals. So this is a metal down here, all the way over here where there were metals, these are metals too. Now, the blue in this case are the elements that are directly along the staircase. And the blue elements were metalloids. Okay, so that guy right there, boron, is a metalloid. All right, and we have about seven metalloids. Over here on the other side of the metalloids, these guys are my non metals. And I do want to key in on this hydrogen as well, is a non metal, although he's located on the other side of the periodic table, he is still in the metal family, okay? So the metals are over here on the left side of the staircase, the metalloids along the staircase, and the non-metals right there. And we do need this in place today. We need to have an understanding of where these are located. Now, ionic bonds were composed, as we saw before, an ionic bond might have been NaCl. One on the left-hand side of the staircase, one on the right-hand side, meaning a metal and a non-metal. So sodium was located right there, and chlorine is located right there. Clearly, one element on each side of the, of the periodic table staircase of a metal and a non-metal. That is what an ionic bond was. An ionic bond resulted attractive force between ions. One was a metal, one was a non-metal. Now, I'm going to throw something else at you right now. Okay? CO2. That's actually a covalent. And I want to demonstrate where it's located. C, O2, carbon and oxygen. And you're going to notice that they're both located on the non-metal side of the staircase. All covalent compounds are composed of non-metals. Another good example would be CF4, carbon tetrafluoride. Once again, carbon is located here, and the fluorines are located right here. So if I want to look at so an element such as Br2, Br2 is bromine. It's a covalent compound. There's bromine. So I just want to key in on this fact because it is an important thing that we understand where our elements that are making up our covalent bonds are located. And they're going to be on this side of the staircase and including hydrogen on the other side. And this slide right here is simply to end, put a finish to ionic compounds for the time being and open the door to covalent compounds. Okay, so let's just go through this here. Ionic compounds are going to run down this list here. Did they transfer or share electrons? They transfer electrons. Were they metals, non-metals, or both? Ionic compounds were composed of metals and non-metals. 
How many electrons did we need? And the key word here was octet. Okay, we had the octet rule. You needed eight electrons to fill up your outer energy level. We could have filled up the outer energy level, and we also could have fallen back. Okay? One would fill up its energy level, and one would fall back. The one that fell back lost electrons. The one that filled up gained electrons. We have a fill up and a fall back in order to get to my eight electrons. We called ionic compounds formula units, and we named them very simply. Sodium, not chlorine, sodium chloride. We have these IDE endings. Now, in covalent compounds, it's not about transfer of electrons. It's all about the sharing. In the sharing relationship, both parties have equal ownership over what they're sharing. That was not the case with ionic compounds. It was a taking, a transfer. Covalent compounds are all made of nonmetals. The octet rule is still in effect right here. That's the octet rule. But there's also a duet rule. All right? Because hydrogen has one electron in its outer shell, and it only needs one more electron to have a full first energy level. As you recall, first energy level, S orbital, had two electrons. So one S2. So I have a duet and octet. We're not looking at any elements that have to fall back. In this case, every element is going to fill up their outer energy level because all nonmetals already have half of their outer energy level filled. We call covalent compounds, we call these group of atoms, we call them molecules. And how we name them is different than ionic compounds. We name them with prefixes such as tetra, carbon tetrafluoride. How about this? Carbon dioxide. So we're going to use these prefixes, di, tetra, tri, as we name our compounds. And as I leave ionic compounds behind and open the door to covalent compounds, I think a good idea for us is to close on the definition of a, and some properties of what covalent compounds are. Okay, so this is simply a form of chemical bonding. Oh, excuse me, guys. This is a form of chemical bonding that is characterized by the, here we go, the key word, the sharing of pairs of electrons between atoms. What do we want to get? We want to get a full energy level. In most cases, a full energy level means eight electrons. In some cases, it means two electrons. Some characteristics about covalent compounds is that the electronegativity difference between the elements that are paired up is going to be less than two. That's going to be a big thing for us here, okay? Because we're dealing with nonmetals, all clustered on the same side of the periodic table, literally the same corner of the periodic table, the upper right-hand corner, we're talking about elements that all have similar sizes. Okay? They're all going to be nonmetals. And when they're all similar sizes, they're all going to have the same or very similar ionization energies. And in this case, we're talking about the upper right-hand corner, high ionization energies. And what does that mean? We learned this back a few weeks ago. It is difficult for any element to remove the outer shell electrons. It takes a lot of power, which is why you're seeing more of a sharing than a taking of electrons. Very difficult to remove these electrons. One thing we're going to key on here also is some properties of these nonmetals is the amount of electrons that they need to form octets in their outer shell. Now, carbon is in group 4. I'm going to write these here. Group 4, group 5, group 6, 7, and 8. And we've also seen them as 14, 15, 16, etc. What I also want to now show is how many atoms do they need in order to have an octet? Well, carbon needs an atom, electron there, I'm sorry, an electron there, an electron there, and an electron there. So it has four, and it's going to need four electrons in order to have an octet. Okay, we have five over here for nitrogen in any element that is in nitrogen's family. It needs one, two, three more. Okay, so anything in group five will need three more electrons. And I think it's going to be pretty crystal clear here. I'm going to need two over here, and I'm going to need one over here, and zero in neon. And the question is, how many bonds will each atom form? The atoms will form as many covalent bonds as this right here, as electrons that they need. I'm going to form four bonds. I'm going to form three bonds, two bonds, 
and one bond and no bonds. Pretty simple. Any carbon atom will form four bonds. And guys, that's where we're going to conclude this lesson. The follow-up lesson, part two of this, really becomes next with how to draw Lewis dot structures. But right now, I want to close on leaving behind ionic bonds. We've learned all the characteristics of them, and now we're opening the doors to covalent bonds and looking at the shared pair of electrons as the covalent bond. All right, guys. Hope that was great. Enjoy.